cryptocurrency, Bitcoin, blockchain, maybe you've heard about it. Maybe you've seen people posting about how they went from a grand or two grand to 20 grand. Well, what the heck is happening? What is cryptocurrency? It's episode 76 of 1004 show and we're talking with Janice Research's own Jeremy Johnson. I'm not going to lie. I don't know a lot about crypto, but I do now that I had this talk with Jeremy. So if you're interested in this crypto world, maybe investing in it, maybe changing the way you think about the world and crypto and online currencies and craziness, this episode's for you. It's episode 76, Jeremy Johnson, Janice Research. I think you guys are going to like it because if you're interested in this world, you're definitely going to know a lot more after this episode. Let's, 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 let's go. Jeremy Johnson, what's up, man? Not much. How are you? I'm good. What is a generalist? A generalist is what you need to be in 2018. But a generalist is someone who has a thirst for curiosity and tries to develop a good understanding of a, a, a lot of different disciplines. And then why I say that is important in 2018 is you have a lot of assistance, whether it's Google, whether it's artificial intelligence, whether it's any uh, of these uh, wonderful tools that exist. If you're a smart person, you can kind of figure out, um, you can kind of figure out where to go and how to learn what you need to learn. And that's the beauty of being a generalist in 2018. How has that changed from years to years or decades? Well, I mean, at one point, you didn't need to be a generalist. You needed to be a specialist in something. When, when, when did that change, do you think? I think uh, probably in the last three to four years, it's really become more apparent. Um, and I think what has changed is just the level of information and tools around information that are now available. Why? So Why? What, what made it change, yeah. I just think the amount of info that is now available, I mean, you have, of course, Wikipedia has been around for a while, Google's been around, YouTube, but there's just so much content now being created on how to. And so because there's so much how to content, um, I think this is why it's more important to be a generalist as opposed to a specialist, unless you're doing something like nuclear fission or something that really is out there that only a few people can do. I think more people need to, especially if you're leading a company, you need to be a generalist and understand how to operate as a generalist. You've been an entrepreneur for quite some time, maybe even decades. You are, what, 35 years old? 37 now. 37. Getting up there. Yes, sir. Getting up there. So I've known you for a few years. What's the evolution of kind of learning from things that didn't work to improve what you're working on now? So meaning like, some projects that you worked on before, whether they're on the agency side where you were working with someone and that, that project that you're working on just never worked or actually a company that you founded and it never got to the, you know, everyone, everyone thinks that their company is going to succeed and do well, but we, we all quickly learn that that doesn't happen. What have you learned kind of good and bad from being exposed to so many different avenues of business? Uh, be open-minded, uh, be creative in your problem solving um, and just stay determined. I think if you can do those things, always look for a solution and you're solution oriented. I think if you keep good communication with people um, and I think if you are attempting to solve a problem, um, then I think those are the greatest lessons that I've learned and I think that's how you can stay successful, especially in a very fast moving um, time that we're in and it's only gonna get faster. You're someone who, while technical, I think often tries to solve problems with quick fixes. I remember um, many moons ago, you were working on a project vinyl mint, and one of the pieces of that you thought could be solved with a simple form. And I right. think it was actually a Wufu form. For someone that's listening that thinks that their technical product or app or whatever it might be needs to be solved day one, with something so specific, how do you challenge their kind of thought process and instead get them to use something that's off the shelf and only a couple of bucks? Um, I think it's all about helping the customer out. And I mean, if you prioritize what the customer wants, uh, that's something that's important, trying to learn and listen to what customers want. And when they tell you what they want, you will see that most times they want the problem fixed. Uh, and they're okay with incremental fixes, 
but you need to address. It's just like if a boat was sinking. You're not going to try and create like the ultimate, you know, uh, plunger or method to stop all the leaks. What you need to do is identify the most urgent problems. You address them. That restores faith. And then from there, you can continue to fix everything else. But it's all about restoring faith and stopping panic in any situation where you have pain points. Um, if you can get rid of the biggest pain, it gives you more time to fix and in a, in a, an ability to address things in a more clear fashion. So, um, yeah, that's, that's always been my philosophy. Very well articulated. Peter Thiel wrote a book, Good to Great. Zero to one. Sorry, Peter Thiel wrote a book. <laughs> good to Great is also a good book. I don't know if you've read that. I read that last year. It's basically taking one concept from a business that has IPO'd and how they get... Um, how do they take that? They're good at one little thing and then how um, to make that even bigger by focusing on that one thing. Really interesting book. So Peter Thiel, uh, the book is... Zero to one. Zero yes. to one, yeah. Mm-hmm. Tell me about that book. What like you, you were telling me a little bit off camera about it. Why is that so important kind of your day-to-day? Um, it's a great book. I've been listening to it, especially over the uh, kind of winter break. Um, you know, it seems a little... A little, a little odd in the beginning, he says, everyone should seek and try to create their own monopoly. And it's like, well, how can everyone have a monopoly? And at first, it seems a little unrealistic. But as he gets into the book, he speaks about how every successful business is a monopoly of some sort. It may not be its product, but it may be its approach. It may be its marketing. It may be its sales process. It may be its customer service. It may be something technical. So you should always look for what you can uniquely do with your business and own that monopoly. And when you own that monopoly, you build a moat around your business and you allow it to be sustainable. And so that's the biggest takeaway I got from it. You need to be the best at what you really are. Some may know you as the founder of John Rich Media, which is an agency where you guys build digital products and and advertising, advertising campaigns for businesses. But... You've also created, because of your work with John Rich Media, Janice Research. You guys can learn about them at Janice, J-A-N-I-S, research.co. What is Janice, the actual word Janice? What's the origins of that? Well, one thing is my mother's name, and then there's also a Greek goddess with the name. And so I always ask... Is your mom a Greek goddess? (laughs) (laughs) In my own mind, yes, yes. And so uh, I'm always thinking about advice she's given me in life, and so... Uh, her name always symbolizes wisdom to me. Have you told her about the business yet? Mm, no. I, you know, what I wanted to do was make it a lot more successful and then kind of let her know, hey, this is, you know, an ode to you. So I guess she'll see it now if she watches this. <laughs> but yeah. What is success to you? How do you define that? Success equals freedom, right? So freedom is the ability to make the moves that you need to move. Um, be able to do what you need to do, uh, freedom to make mistakes and learn, and really have no real consequences or serious consequences that come from that. I mean, in that, I mean, you know, there's, there's always going to be financial goals within that, and, and definitely that is what is important. I've always known you to be a risk taker. What's yes, sir. Some, what's something that you have done and lost on big time? Wow. In business, in life, what specifically? <laughs> well, maybe a little bit of both. <laughs> I'm going to stick with just business because there's been definitely a lot of things in life that I have uh, <laughs> probably taken unnecessary risk on. But uh, here's the thing. Um, I kind of learned early on in life that if you're afraid of risk, you will never develop the skill of taking risk. And so I started challenging myself because I was very risk averse. And I still am to a degree very risk averse. I have a lot of life insurance policies. I have as much insurance as a person can have because I do um, have a a fear of risk. However, um, I think you truly live life when you understand how to thrive when you're uncomfortable. Um, One of my uh, passions, which... I've always loved financial markets, and so uh, one of my early on risks was I checked out a couple uh, online classes and talked to a couple people, and I decided I was going to start trying to do some uh, trading with options, and I'd saved up some money for a couple months, and I got in there, and on the first day of trading, I lost like 70%. So that was one of the best, one of the biggest risks, but I learned a lot from that, and um, 
you know, you start to realize that with anything that you want to do in life, you got to learn it over a period of time. I think we live in a time to go back to what we talked about earlier with us being generalists. Um, you feel like you can learn pretty much anything on the internet. It is true. The key now is experience. It's the, the muscle memory you build from the experience. So yeah, you can learn something technically, but you're going to have to go through the experience. You're going to have to go through the portion where you feel uncomfortable and you're comfortable with taking calculated risk. It's all about probability. And, um, so I've learned those lessons through taking some risk and, you know, now it's, uh, even when I get in an uncomfortable situation, I'm able to uh, navigate it better because I've, I've seen it before. So I've built that thick skin. I've built that skill set of understanding how to be uncomfortable when that comes on you. Interesting. You are a subscriber to YouTube University or the online uh, piece. You bought a, what was it, a Udemy account? What, yeah. And you spent like three grand and, and learned what trade from that? Oh, well, lynda.com was my Lynda.com. Right. Um, I learned web development. I improved my video. So pretty much, I mean, I went to college and got my formal degree in marketing. Um, but how I've actually earned my living my entire life has been off skills I've learned online, whether it's web development or internships that I did with video production and audio. But I did go to school formally to be an audio engineer. That gave me enough of a background to... Um, have the technical abilities to do a lot of production and build on. Um, but I'd say the skills that I've learned the best as a business person came from either experience in person, which was shooting video and getting that experience, being a bartender, which helped me to become a great salesperson and customer service agent, and online, which taught me how to a um, build websites, um, do UI design, um, now look at cryptocurrencies and just different things, even investing. Those are those are how I learn different things just from spending a lot of time and also altering my learning style. I mean, I think a lot of us, we grow up in a classroom setting. That's how we learn. In today's time, you have to learn how to do things via video instruction. And so a lot of that is you taking the efforts to uh, adjust your learning style to um, take on information in new ways so that you can advance. If we're not learning, we're dying. It's one of my yeah, you're falling quotes. behind for sure. Yeah. You mentioned cryptocurrency. That's a big thing that you're doing. You've gotten into it over the last several years. A lot of people listening are still confused as to what it is. So let's first just start off with what is cryptocurrency? So it's definitely a new asset class. And I think you got, like you said, a lot of people hear it and they think automatically. Some people think scams, some people think get rich quick scheme, some people think um, new technology, and a lot of people, like you said, just don't understand it. Um, what brought me to the space was, as with anything, um, I need to always try to understand what's coming next in any form of new technology. And so I said, well, let me understand it. I, I really need to take some time to see what this is all about. Um, so. Of course, everyone's heard of Bitcoin, and as you get into it, you start learning about some of the other ones, but more specifically, you learn about the technology and the uh, the issues that it's trying to solve. So, got in it, and was like, wow, this is really interesting, and kind of fell down the rabbit hole, and never looked back. And so, as I've learned more and more about it and talked to people, I saw that there was a real need to teach people the basics, so if this is something that they want to get into, where can they go to learn more about it? Uh, yes, trading is an important piece of it. If that's what you want to do, that definitely contains risk. But I think more importantly, even if you're not interested in trading it, I think it's important to understand the technological developments that are coming from it because it will have some impact on the future. I mean, as an advertiser, um, some of the technologies and theories that are coming from cryptocurrency are really interesting. And they bridge a relationship between the customer and the advertiser with kind of removing third parties like Facebook and Google. And it's a pretty interesting um, concept um, that I could see work because when you look at the current economics of online advertising, it's putting a lot of businesses out of, uh, it's, 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 it's crushing a lot of the profits of a lot of companies. And so um, what I like in general about, and they call them cryptocurrencies, I think a better name for them is actually crypto tokens. I think if we stop using the word 
currency, it would stop confusing a lot of people. And so I think if we started calling them digital tokens, I think it would help a lot more people to understand what this space is really about. Um, but what they are is basically the core of them, or the core of some of them, is they're built, built on a technology called a blockchain. Um, the blockchain is, is nothing more than a decentralized ledger. And so it's a way that transactions go in and out. And instead of being housed in one centralized server environment, it's spread throughout the internet. Um, what makes this, some of the pros of this technological approach are that because you have a greater diversity of um, nodes, it's harder to a hack it, take it down, um, it creates more transparency. And some, those are some of the issues that we have. So for example, with Bitcoin, as a technology, its full purpose is that it is a um, money transfer platform. It's just like email, but it's email for money. So just like nobody owns the email protocol, the SM, STMP, no one owns Bitcoin. But what you can do with these geniuses were, were, have allowed is you can now buy shares of this particular protocol. So now ownership can be spread to everyone. And it's 21 million shares? 21 million shares, increments, um, will be produced in totality. But it goes down to eight decimal places of one that's called a share, for lack of a better word. So the thing I often ask everybody is, when a lot of people say, well, they don't really believe, they don't understand Bitcoin, I say, well, what if you could make email into a token or a share? How much do you think email will be worth? Trillions of dollars because of the utility of the technology. And the thinking behind the, this type of ownership model was that when you have technologies like S STMP or SSL, these are protocols that someone has to maintain, even Linux, open source projects. The problem is usually open source projects have a lot of businesses built on top, but the problem is they don't have many people developing and supporting them because there's no economic incentive. So if we say, hey, how about we allow the economic incentive to be shared amongst everyone for a protocol, think about how much more energy and maintenance that protocol is gonna get because people's direct net worth is tied into it. It's quite genius. And so that's why you have a software like the Bitcoin protocol that's being developed um, rapidly because so many people's net worth is tied into it. And so it's not really a currency, it's a technology. It's just that now you can buy tokenized shares of the technology and that's what makes this different and that's what i think a lot of people miss mm. and so now you're taking open source protocols and projects that before would have maybe had a core team of 100 people working on it and now you're having millions of people have interest in these things and it's pushing the next version of the internet forward um, the big move with all these digital tokens is was the decentralization and why that's so important is things like Equifax, where all our information is held in one group of servers. And if you get inside, this one hacker or bad guy can get inside, that can be a major exploit and look at the kind of damage. We don't even know what's, like we haven't even felt the effects of like the exploit hack of Equifax yet. And then you have Equifax, they're the custodian of all these records. They basically pay out a little fee and it kind of goes away and the rest of us are dealing with this forever. Uh, the decentralized world says, why do we need to have a, our credit score stored in some centralized server? Why can't we use encryption? And why can't we each be responsible for our credit score and permission it out to people through the use of a token? Th these are some of the concepts that, that are going on inside of this world. So you, you mentioned earlier th about the issue, the, the crypto issue that they're trying to solve. In a sentence or two, what do you really think that issue is? Um, the issue is ownership. Um, right now, most of the internet is owned by the big five, you know, Microsoft, Amazon, Google, Facebook, and Apple. And what people are trying to do is they feel like that creates too much of a risk. It creates a risk for censorship. It creates a risk of um, economic disincentives. It creates a risk of lack of innovation. It creates a risk of security um it creates a lot of risk it creates yeah it creates so many risks that in a lot of people's minds that's not what the internet was supposed to be the internet was supposed to be a network of peer-to-peer -peer communication peer-to-peer 
uh, interactions that can't be censored and information is free to flow. And so by making things more decentralized and putting the power back in the hands of the many, we will be able to have that freedom that was intended with the internet. Crypto 101, I think you just gave a good kind of understanding of what that is. So blockchain, you said decentralized ledger. What do you mean by that? So it's just like an accounting ledger. A basic ledger is ins and outs, transition, transaction in, transaction out. The genius with the blockchain is, you remember Napster. This is the analogy I give a lot of people. Remember when Napster came out and um, the authorities first saw it, thought it was a joke, and what it was was Napster was just peer-to-peer -peer file sharing, right? So instead of you going to iTunes to download music, you would say, you'd go to a site and say, I want to download this song, and you would download the song from like 50 to 60 different sources simultaneously. Well, what made that technology of BitTorrent so difficult to control was that instead of you being able to attack one point, you had to try to attack all. And because these sources are spread all over the internet, it's almost impossible. Well, reverse that and instead do transactions in the same way. So as a transaction occurs, it's broadcast to a multitude of nodes who receive this information. And so that level of transparency as these transactions are broadcast to this um, decentralized network is what gives it the strength. You can't fudge or inject false transactions without taking over a significant portion of the network. And so that's what's given Bitcoin is security. And so, you know, you got something that's worth 200 plus billion dollars and it's never been hacked. Because there's so many points that they have because to. Because there's so many points. And if you look at everything, the movement in this world right now is in decentralization. We had a moment of centralization, but if you look at the technology of everything, whether it's internet, node networks, there's all about mesh networks. If you're looking at um, governments, there's a push now for people to stop globalizing so much and to bring things back more local and more decentralized. You look at satellite infrastructure, they have these new types of square satellites that are a lot smaller, where they shoot out a bunch of satellites and it creates a constellation of images. You look at everything, it's all about people realize that decentralization is cheaper, it creates um, more points so it's harder to take down, and it can provide a broader image of things or broader representation, representation of things because it's so diverse in its nature. And so the trend is there, I mean, that decentralization is where people want because people want more control and they want the control that is put on them to be closer to them and more relevant to them. As we're shooting this, it's January 17th, 2018. I believe in the summer of 2017, it was around a thousand bucks. And then what, November, December of this year, it went up all the way to 19 grand, had a crazy day. Yesterday it tanked, what, 40%? Something like that. So yeah. it's right now around $9,000. Which so, to a lot of people, that's scary stuff. But I mean, it started at 1,000 in January of last year. It's at 9,000 right sure. now. I mean, I, mean, I remember people saying that if you bought it, you know, seven years ago, you oh, bought a $1,000 worth of it, it's, um, there were $71 million or something crazy like that. So I want to talk about the, um, it being so, you know, ups and downs and craziness sure. of it. But have you heard the story about the guy who, has like $40 million worth of Bitcoin on a hard drive, but he can't find his password and he threw it away. Right, in the landfill? And in the landfill, and he's thinking about buying the landfill. Have you heard right. this story? I've heard about this. Yeah, I mean, that's, that, it, that's the crazy thing about it is um, some people got really lucky and now they're, <laughs> you know, realizing the mistakes they made. I mean, it's kind of crazy. Um, some people out there who bought this stuff and forgot about it and then they were like, wait a minute. I've heard several people who were playing around in it when it was like, you know, pennies and right. cent and forgot about it and now they're like, wow. I mean, there's tons of stories. It's like a guy who had bought some, forgot about it for a research project, realized it was worth 800000 bought a new house in like wow. Scandinavia somewhere. I mean, it's just, you know, I mean, a once in a lifetime type of, type of opportunity. Um, some people just got really lucky. So the high, the high highs, the low lows, like it's it's still probably a very immature 
yeah. platform. Like I liken it to like the solar system. When the solar system or any new dynamic form of energy is created, it's going to be very chaotic in the beginning, right? And it's not until things, as we're babies, we're kicking and screaming, right? I mean, we're full of energy. We're trying to fill our ways out. And as we get older, we become more stable and more mature. And I think, I mean, you're talking about a market that's like $500 billion around this time now. I mean, that pales in comparison when you're talking about like the U.S. economy is almost 20 trillion or, you know, you look at like gold is a seven trillion dollar market. And I think all the currency in the world is over 150 trillion dollars. I mean, it's very, very, very small. And again, this is just another market of energy Um, and it's technology. It's just. So this is to be expected as you have new people coming in, there's going to be manipulation, there's going to be just chaos. And in that chaos and lack of regulation, this is what one should expect. Um, But that lack of regulation is also allowing a lot of innovation and it's also going to allow a lot of scams. But that's just the nature of of things. You know, it's just like the Internet, the lack of free speech uh, regulation is why you have a lot of Twitter bots that are terrible. But also that lack of regulation is what has allowed things like Wikipedia and Google search engines to occur and allowed the knowledge of mankind to just, you know, infinitely grow. So how, how does net neutrality come in to this? Um, it's a difficult thing. Some people argue that a ISP provider could block access to certain sites. Um, again, that, the ruling is pulling away some of the regulation, but with some of the wealth that's been created, there's no reason that you can't have a decentralized ISP that pops up with some of the gains that have been made that would support it. I mean, there's even like a Bitcoin satellite that um, you can do some of your transactions on. So just like any market, I think um, if someone owns a network, they can close things off. I don't see what the incentive would be. Um, because if I'm Verizon, I just want traffic. I want you up there. Bam, it's that time to answer your questions. It's hashtag AskZach, where I answer the questions that you guys have. If you guys have questions, all you have to do is comment below or head on over to startwithhatch.com slash ask, where you get to ask your question, and I see it, and I answer it. So today we have a question from James Vanderpool. He's a realtor at VanderpoolRealEstate.com. You guys can learn about all all about him and his company at VanderpoolRealEstate.com. We'll have all this in the description in the show notes. He wants to know, how can I market my real estate business through content? Great question, James. The first thing I would do is really understand what you're already doing. Oftentimes people have something that's working really well and they want this new shiny thing instead. I think that's a bad idea because the hardest thing in business, the hardest thing in marketing is finding out that thing that works and you might already have it. And all you need to do is actually just throw more dollars at that. So first take an inventory of what you're currently doing or what you've done in the past and see if some of them are actually working. Again, oftentimes we do have something that's working. We just haven't put a lot of attention and money towards it and we think it's not working. And so really understanding if your strategies that you're doing currently are or are not working. And then think about this. So when we're marketing, a lot of times we're doing this thing once, once, and it's never seen again, or it's not searchable. And so think about it from this. Let's say you do a Facebook Live video and your description or your headline for it is poor. It's not really that searchable. So I think the content that you're pushing out on Facebook Live or anywhere could be important, but the copy associated with that is really, really important so that it can be searchable. And so if you're doing a video on Instagram, I know uh, he said in his videos, or in, in his question, he's trying to improve his Instagram, that's great. But you want to make sure that you're driving people back towards, uh, towards the content that is searchable. James wants to make sure that he is when people have questions about real estate, the person that people think about. And that's why you should do videos like, you know, maybe starting to ask James uh, as well. But you wanna make sure that whatever you're doing on social medias can then also be tracked and searchable at a later time so that you're building up that kind of special sauce 
on the back end of the search engines. So be thinking about ways that you can take the video that you're doing and then go to vanderpoolrealestate.com backslash this blog post and then take that same concept from video form and put it in copy form. You could still even embed the video. That doesn't matter. But what you want to make sure is that the the way that you know the Googles and the Bings of the world, they're scraping copy. They're, they're, they're scraping what the text of what you're doing is saying. So they can't read your video and, and it understand that it's saying all this great information. So you have to tell it what you're saying. So keep doing those social media videos, those images, but then also make sure that whatever you're doing that has amazing concepts and content behind it, you're also then taking the copy, the text, the words out of that and putting that on something searchable like a blog post so that you can get that later. And also make sure that you're using the keywords that these people are searching for. So James lives in Virginia, maybe it's best realtors in Virginia. And make sure that a lot of your copy is associated with winning those keywords, basically. Another thing you want to do is create a content calendar. So when I worked in news, they knew that you know these stories always needed to go out at a certain time. It's the same for blog content. It's the same for content in general. For with Hatch, we have a content calendar as well. It's saying that I'm going to go on Facebook Live at this point. I'm going to do this. We're going to post this on Twitter at this point. The same concept. Know when and what you're going to post and where you're going to post it and to put on a calendar and follow that religiously. Also, it allows you kind of to understand what you need to be doing. And if you need to change things, if something's working more, maybe you realize that a Facebook Live video to then push that to a blog post is working really well, then you wanna start doing more of that and less of the things that aren't working. But the key is always this, remember to create content that is forever searchable. Because at the end of the day, you wanna make sure that people can find you over and over again. James, I hope this helps. If you guys have questions, all you have to do is go to startwithhatch.com backslash ask and ask away. Back to it. Talk with Jeremy Johnson, Janice Research. You guys can learn about them. Janice Research, J-A-N-I-S research.co. There you go. Janice research.com wasn't available? No, it wasn't at the time. So, you know, and I'm also trying to, you know, futuristic and forward thinking most of the dot co websites um kind of try to tell you that but you know might grab that dot com in the future we were talking with mark rowan of hackworth printing you might know him uh and they bought hackworth.co um and they wanted to buy hackworth.com but it was some military vet um mm. and his website was hackworth.com uh, and he said that you know it's it's definitely a challenge because definitely people you know, go to the dot com instead right. of the dot co. So, how do you kind of eliminate that um, that point of you know m miscommunication? Sure. Because in their minds, people always go to dot com, even though you have a dot co. Well, the good thing about an online business is, I think a lot of the traffic is going to come directly from links, you know, or articles. So, I don't think it's as critical when you have like a offline business, people hear a name, they're going to automatically make the assumption of .com. But the way that people are going to be driven to this particular link is through some speaking engagement where they're going to see an end card that has the direct link on it or a video or something like that. You Usually, they're going to be dropped off at the front door in a more guided fashion, I think, when you're strictly online. Solid answer. What's something that you've learned over the past decade that really helped you evolve as a business owner? Um, like I said, being comfortable with the uncomfortable, learning that where there are, where things are difficult is where opportunities exist. That's what I've learned. That's the principle I try to stick with. If people can't figure something out, that means someone's willing to exchange cash for the solving of that problem. You've seen the Jeff Bezos picture of where he's sitting on a piece of plywood working at Amazon like 20 years ago. Mm, I haven't. I'll send it to you. But basically, he's sitting in an office. Apparently, when he took this picture, he was already a billionaire. But basically, <laughs> he's sitting in a not so pretty, you know, piece of plywood up like that. It kind of sure. reminds me of you. Like it doesn't really matter <laughs> type of thing. Like why? Why do you? There's a stigma that you know you own a business, you're super successful, you're rich, whatever. But like you've given up a lot of things to to live this lifestyle, to get to that freedom. 
kind of walk me through the the concept of you giving up now so that you can have a lot more later so i've always been focused on what am i going to be like when i'm 70 years old right that's always my driving force in life like i'm not so much worried about right now because the things that i want pretty simple you know some good food the ability to sleep to go do a few things that i want to do entertainment whatever right my needs aren't really that expansive when I'm 80, 70 years old, I'm not going to have the energy. I'm not going to have the flexibility. I'm not going to have the majority of the uh, pros that I have working for me right now. So I'm always thinking about the last 20, 15 years of my life. I want to be that guy who can walk around and help as many people as I can, but also be that guy who has no worries in life. And so I'm always about delayed gratification because... Um, at some point, you're going to have to work hard in life. I'd rather do it on the front end. Who created Bitcoin? There's you know, thought that it was Elon Musk? Um, people have said that because that was actually one of the early goals of PayPal was to have an anonymous internet currency. Well, to have an internet currency. Um, it's a guy named Satoshi Nakamoto. People say it's a pseudonym, if that's the correct word. Some people think it's a group of individuals, but it's an anonymous source. So no one really knows. Do you think they'll ever figure that out? Um, there has been rumors that some people think, I've, I've heard some people say it's an AI that created it and it's oh. reversing its way. Some people say- So a robot uh, built Bitcoin? Well, so there, this is going a little bit deeper. So there is an actual cryptocurrency for artificial intelligence now. And some people are thinking that through a program and an experiment, the artificial intelligence created the rules for what it would need to grow itself out. Um, that's one theory. Um, others think it was some gentlemen who were working on this concept before who worked in kind of secret and put it all out together. Um, we really don't know, but what I will tell you is it's like an alien-like technology. It's kind of like fire, you know, when people say, who created fire, right? Is that important or is the concept that this technology was put on man and now man can kind of see what they can do with it? I really like and the, that technology is the blockchain. I really like the way that you described this from the Napster days, right? Right. I, um, you know, downloading it from so many different people and this you, you're getting this technology from so many different people. It, it at this point has not been hacked, or at least we don't think it's been hacked. Um, and so that's that's good to know. What, what's something about crypto that we haven't talked about yet? Well, I mean, like I said, there's over 1,400 other cryptocurrencies. Now, a lot of them are scams or a lot of hype. Um, you have another one called Ethereum, which is kind of like Linux, the Linux of cryptocurrencies where... What does that mean, the Linux? the Linux? So Linux is software or apps. You can build apps on top of Linux, right? So Bitcoin is strictly about sending value back and forth. Um, so then... A gentleman named uh, Vitalik Butrin created this one called Ethereum. And what it allows you to do is build applications on top of this decentralized network. So you can have all kinds of cool things, what are called smart contracts, or they call it programmable money. But here are some examples. So one would be prediction markets, one might call that gambling. Right now, you have a bookie who is a centralized source. The bookie takes money as escrow. The bookie says, I will take, Zach and I have a wager. We need some trusted source to manage this wager, right? I've learned my lesson on wagers with you. Un understood, but <laughs> in a normal way, especially on the internet or people who don't have a personal relationship, there has to be some unbiased trusted source that sits in the middle. And if this unbiased, unbiased trusted source just sat in the middle and didn't really collect a major fee, it would be okay. But as we know humans, the house is going to then get in the game as well. And it almost becomes three players against each other with the player in the middle having the best advantage. With Ethereum, what you can do is you and I can say, hey, let's make a friendly wager that the U.S. wins 15 medals in the Olympics. And you might say, no, the U.S. will not win 15 medals in the Olympics. We can build what's called a smart contract, which would say the clearly defined standards are that the U.S. team will win these 15 medals. We will assign the data sources that are trusted that will feed this information in. We will make our wager. We will both pay our money to this smart contract. 
as soon as the information comes in, the requirements are met, the, the 15 medals were made or not, the funds will be automatically released. So, so you're taking away... So, so ESPN has this thing called Streak, where they, maybe you've seen it, where basically they have a bunch of their users go in and they try and pick games. Every time you win a game, you either get you know a one you know, or a check that you won or an X that you lost. So basically you're saying that if, if you were to put money in this thing, like an ESPN streak, and, mm -hmm. and the data is already predetermined as to mm -hmm. what you're going to be doing, mm -hmm. and if you say yes, 15 medals, or no, 15 mm -hmm. medals, as soon as that thing happens, the money goes the way that it was supposed to go. Correct. And a minimum fee is taken. You, you also so, said that this potentially could be done... With uh, anything. With anything. So like I could do a speaking gig. Exactly. How, so, do, how do they get the data point in that case? Uh, now that that would all be determined in the contract, right? So you'd have to say it could be a check-in, it could be that's the flexibility of the application that can be built. But there's where all the opportunity exists. It could be someone writes a smart contract that says this person cuts my grass every such and such day, and in the future, if there was some way for the program to determine that the grass was cut, it could automatically pay. But this is where the opportunity is existing, right? These are where people can use their imaginations to make this stuff come true, but this is the power of this technology. Um, but why should yeah. someone, from a financial standpoint, why should someone do it that way instead of just credit card, you know, well, using using credit card. Right, well, one, one, bank, one of the big issues I'm sure you checks. know as small business owner is uh, about the time amount that it takes to get paid a lot of the times. So the incentive would be, hey, I want to know that you're serious and I can look at this particular piece of software and see that the value that you're going to pay me for the speaking gig is sitting there. And that person can say, hey, Zach, I'm letting you know I'm serious. The value is sitting in this contract. So like so an escrow account? Out. It's like an escrow account, but a skinny escrow account. It doesn't have the person managing it. It's all done by software. So that would be an example. Um, but just think about that speed of transaction. The faster people get paid, the faster commerce can happen, the faster economies can grow. So look at all of the benefits that would come from that. I remember one time you were in Raleigh and how fast the internet was there. I think it was Google Fiber or something. It was, it was something super fast. And you were like, it was like 100 times faster than you were <laughs> used to. And you were able to be a lot more efficient and you could get a lot more sure. work done. Um, so it, it's interesting that you make that point. I still think it's interesting that you know banks... Um, stop at five o'clock. You can't make payments right. after that's a certain another, time, and all, all this. I'm like, why? Well, like, it is 2018. Has to be closed now. I mean, you think with the smart contract. So you think this closes business, banks? I don't think it closes banks. I think it becomes a competitive. So part of the the method of Bitcoin is people saying, "Hey, we need to be in charge of our own funds," and so it challenges banks, right? So you look at something like, um, and this isn't crypto, but I think crypto has had. An effect on it, there's that app. Um, what is the app that all the young people use uh, to pay each other? Uh, Venmo. Venmo. Venmo? Right. So yeah. Venmo allows instant payment to say, hey, I want to split this bill up. Boom, I pay you through a text message, right? Didn't PayPal buy that? PayPal bought it from yeah. a company called Braintree. Well, guess what happened? Now the banks are getting around to creating their own version called Zelly. And they've had it for a while, but it forced them. Well, Bitcoin does the same thing only you can't reverse that transaction. So it's like cash. This is the thing. There was no way to really spend, spend the efficiency of cash. Like you pay a cab driver, you pay him in cash. It's non-refundable, right? Unless you ask for that money back. So that, that the fact that you can send a non-refundable transaction, think about we have a use for cash and we've always had a use for cash. But as we go to more digital payments, cash the, the, the efficiency of cash or the, the definitiveness of cash was being removed. Well, Bitcoin is one of those technologies that was allowing that to kind of continue. It's also kind of like a gift card, I guess, where you've already bought that in case so that, that that consumer that's buying it or the person that's making sure that the money's there. I guess you kind of know that it's there from a gift card. Maybe not. Yeah. Well, yeah. Yeah. So from like a, from like a, a gambling perspective, mm -hmm. like, I know you like gambling a little bit. Um, Less now that I've gotten into this, for uh, sure. So is this a gamble, though? I think there. Uh, okay, so speculation, absolutely. The fact that the price ran up to 20 Gs in one month, that's gambling. <laughs> absolutely. 
um, the whole market growth, a lot of it is people gambling. Um, but it's so gambling, the, like I'm playing blackjack, or I'm I'm playing roulette, yeah, or I'm betting like the 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 Patriots to win the Super Bowl. Like, I think some people have treated it like that, but I think it's more like speculation would be a better word, which is a form of gambling. Um, speculating, it's just like what venture capitalists do. They speculate on new companies, right? They will say, I got $100 million, and I'll invest a million in 100 companies. And all so, like spec- so speculating, like predicting the future? Like we, we predict, we speculate that this thing is going to happen, so we're going to buy it at this little thing, hoping that we get some sort of crazy multiplier? We speculate that this particular crypto will solve a use case that is a huge pain point. When it does, that value of that crypto will grow. Can you explain why there's 1,400 different types of... Survival of the fittest, Darwinism, and competition. Why were there 50 versions of social networks and Facebook One? I mean... But they all sit on... What's the thing? No, they're their own things. I mean, so Bitcoin is one. Ethereum is another. A lot of them... So uh, Ethereum created the platform that you could build more specific smart contracts on top of. So a good number sit on top of Ethereum as well. Is that kind of like... Is, so is Ethereum. Ethereum, yeah. Ethereum, yes. I'm also learning about this as much as possible. Right. So is it kind of like uh, iOS? You could call it like iOS or the Google Play Store. That would be the best way. So imagine an open source currency platform that you can build specific smart contract applications on top of, but you don't have to build it from scratch because the basic infrastructure is there so you can get to market a lot quicker with your idea. So it's kind of like WordPress and it's a CMS we can build. Kind of like to. WordPress for a digital currency. Interesting. What do you think the next thing to be built on is? Not from a financial perspective, but like if you got like WordPress is for websites, uh, Ethereum. Am I saying that right? In, in Ethereum yeah. is uh, for you know bit and crypto currencies. Like what? What's that next thing that within this particular space? No, like like. In general, like what's the next thing where they build a CMS? I, I mean, honestly, I think this is this is where you're because the problem with most things online is the economic models of them, right? So it's very difficult for a small town publisher now to make a living, right? Um, it's difficult for with with such large entities like Amazon and Google. We're all kind of serfs <laughs> in their world, right? It's like feudalism. And so this is an effort to bring democracy back to this feudalistic society that's kind of being created online. And so if you can cut out middlemen, you can have more direct relationships between individuals and companies like you have in the real world. Um, And that's why, you know, you look at the real world, you have a place for small businesses because some people prefer the direct relationship. But online, because of just the nature of efficiency, oftentimes it's hard to compete without using one of the big five to somehow address or get the customers you need. So I really do think, I mean, they even have a crypto that's backing space exploration. I mean, you look at almost any problem out there. If you can say everyone can share in the wealth through ownership of the initiative, and if the token itself is, if the initiative is proving value and there's a token attached to it, there will be people interested in buying that particular crypto that finances whatever initiative it is. So it's actually really changing the incentives of economies. And I think, you know, some people will hear that, but I think our capitalistic society, and I'm an ultimate capitalist, has never, it's it's one in the current financial in the current models of governance it has, it's the clear winner right um but i think like anything if you are a person who believes in open source and technology and human advancement everything should be challenged and i think this kind of ownership by shares like a corporation now you have a small group of shareholders you have employees and so sometimes the incentives aren't there but if everyone can own into an idea and that idea creates value like the technology behind email it clearly has value if everyone could own into that why wouldn't the incentives behind that continue to increase create value for it what's in your hand uh this guy sent billy jean marketing pretty cool he sends his scripts on this poker chip usb drive 
So it's a pretty cool uh, idea, you know, for people, uh, for marketing. I always liked it. Good reminder. How old is that? I got it a couple months ago. It's pretty, pretty new. Cool. What about the governance or government piece to crypto? Like, sure. is, is it there yet? Like, are... uh, Well, I think 2018 is the year the governments really try to come in and um, control it. But I think, hence why I use the Napster example, uh, I think it's going to be pretty difficult, too, because of the fact that it's decentralized. And so crypto kind of is like the ultimate siren. Like, it baits everybody in with the profits and no, you have you would almost have to have all governments coordinate at the same time to basically regulate it. And you have every country has what's called their interest. So if one country moves to ban it, like a China who talks about it, South Korea who talked about potentially banning it, looks at hey, here's a way that we can own a portion of the future economy. Why would we ban it? Why shouldn't we be the hub? So a lot of times when the Chinese have cracked down, a lot of those have run to Japan who was super open arms about crypto. And so a lot of the countries, one of the biggest exchanges called Binance, it's a Chinese exchange. As the Chinese government started to crack it down, they moved to Tokyo. And Tokyo's got warm arms. Switzerland's another country. Switzerland is trying to be the Silicon Valley of the whole cryptocurrency um, movement. And so every country, particularly a lot of these mid-sized countries, will see this as a way to lower capital to their country, to lower talent to their countries. Why would they regulate it when they can miss out? And as you see this kind of whack-a-mole that will happen with regulations, eventually governments will have to look at it and say, hey, we could just make tax money off of this um, and adopt it, or we can keep trying to control it. Um, but I also think um, you do have some regulation that has come in. So like in the U.S., there's a site called Coinbase. Coinbase is kind of the entry and out, out is an entry point and out point for switching your fiat currency, USD, to Bitcoin. And that has all the standard AML and KYC, which are like anti-money laundering and know your customer laws, and they have to you know, report suspicious behavior. Um, so you have the regulation on the front end. Once you kind of get into this world, uh, that's where it gets a little bit more difficult. Um, but it seems like the US is approaching on a nice, nice balanced approach. If someone is interested in learning about this, buying into some of it, what, what are some good websites where they can learn about it? Well, number one, they can come to Janus Research because that's the service we offer, which is we teach people about um, all of this stuff, not just from the investment perspective, but A, to learn about the different ones, to go where they can go, to show them where they can go to learn about the different currencies that exist, more importantly, how to store and protect the cryptocurrencies because that's a huge portion is now you are responsible for your own management and storing and protection. Um, but other ones would be like Cointelegraph, uh, Bitcoin.com, um, Telegram. The app itself is a huge source because you can go and follow a lot of these different projects and you can get on their Telegram groups. And that's what you really learn about. And then YouTube. YouTube's huge. Um, and I'd even say Twitch. That's another good one. When Bitcoin drops 50% in a day and goes from 20 to 10, do you freak out? No, because you become immune, right? And so I remember when I first got in, so it's about 2,500. <clears throat> it's a very, very, what they call it, a lot of weak hands, a lot of speculators. Uh, I ran up to about $5,000 per Bitcoin probably a month and a half later. And some people will say that seems crazy, but a lot of it had to do with um, market adoption. People, more people becoming aware of it. Then China came out and said they were going to start banning what are called ICOs, which is how a lot of new coins will be created. And then J.P. Morgan Chase's president called it a scam. Price dropped all the way down to about $2,800. And I said, you know what? If you have the mind state, which I did, was I'm going to take this investment as more of a learning. So I've already lost it. Then I said, you know, I'm not going to worry about it. I'm just going to let it stay and uh, see what it does. And within a month, it rebounded back to the $5,000 price. Um, a lot of it is there's a lot of people who are believers. And the thing about it is you've got some of the world's smartest people working on this. And what I have learned about life is, no offense to people who work at the government, there's a lot of smart people who work at the government, 
But I think there's a lot of really smart people who don't work for the government, who are in kind of the private sector, who have. And the reason I would say they're smart is because they don't have some of the limitations and bureaucracy that people in the government have to face, right? And so you're talking about some of the most adaptive, innovative individuals, and they're always looking to fix a challenge. And so every time something gets thrown at it, this space allows them to experiment, and it has a real scorecard, the value that is attached to it. You can you can solve problems. You can be creative. You can do those things where I think in a lot of bureaucracies there are um, things where there's you know politics or governance like that. You um, you kind of just fill out a, a lot spreadsheet. of the energy gets used in the interworkings of that particular industry. Yeah. With this, the energy is used purely on the idea. I, I recently so it's just more efficient energy. I recently wrote a blog post uh, called uh, "How to Build a Startup Ecosystem Space, like a co-working space in Incubator or whatever," and and I kind of put it back and forth. I know that you've worked out of one, so that's why I think this is appropriate to say. But um, basically, the ones that are done privately or not publicly or private public. Um, private usually has the best opportunity because they can actually fill to the space. They can actually create that voice. They can create that community where they can if, adapt. You're, if you're building it from a public perspective, you have to just, There's more you, challenge. Have, you have to follow more rules. Yes. Yeah. So if you guys Absolutely. are interested, if you guys are interested in that, it's start with hatch.com backslash ecosystem, Jeremy Johnson, Janus research.co episode 76, J A N I S last words, research. Um, last words. Um, like what I said, I said I think, what did I say? Chance research.co. Yeah. When you were spelling it out, but no, oh. um, last words would be, I think this is an exciting space. Uh, this is where we are. This is the next version of the internet. There's whether it's Bitcoin or not, the future of the internet will be decentralization, just economics, just people's desire for control. Just, I mean, you see it, the way people are piling into it, there is a demand for people to have more control and be able to express themselves more. So whether you believe it's just, you know, you don't want to get up in a speculative aspect, I think it's very important to understand this idea has been let out the bag and it's going to be difficult to put it back in. And so I think, you know, everyone should take the time to learn instead of rejecting it or just listening to what the news is talking about, because a lot of the people on the news, they're just as clueless as the people who don't know anything about it. They're just talking about it for strictly ratings. But you can tell based off of the things that they say, there's a lot of inaccurate information that's put on Bloomberg and CNBC. Um, and if you follow Twitter, you can quickly see how people are critiquing it and kind of making fun of the reporters because they can tell they don't know what they're talking about. But the point is, I think, and I know you have your own views on some of that stuff, but the truth is this is a, a fascinating uh, industry with a lot of energy behind it, and it's definitely going to be the future in some way shape or form and i think anybody who's trying to be adaptive and future oriented they should take some time and learn about it i think the challenge with the press and the media with this is is they're not experts but they try to communicate on it and it's it's not just with crypto it's with businesses in general so they don't they're reporting on something that they don't know the ins and outs of and then when they're reporting that it's if you own a business it's very clear that uh, this doesn't sound right, and I can't imagine that business owner would act that way. This isn't even a normal way. And so I, I understand why they have to communicate this information. But they're communicating to thousands to millions of people information that they don't even understand so that when they do communicate it, it's, it doesn't make sense. And so to do something like with crypto that is potentially very confusing to people i mean phew, it's right over the top right. of heads and then people are like oh i shouldn't do this it's so bad and you're like actually you, you really don't even understand it yes and if there's so risk bad, associated, why are the but... banks why are the banks all rolling out products if it's so bad why are, why is the nasdaq talking about rolling out a bitcoin product well i remember why seven years the... ago people were uh accepting they start um was it Tiger Direct that started taking mm -hmm. the, yeah, yeah, I mean, like five, six years ago, Tiger Direct, a very well-known online. Overstock.com. Um, computer site. Yeah, I mean, it's just, when sites start doing that, there's a reason why. Dumars in, in the Norfolk area, I think uh, uh, you can pay with Bitcoin, so it's cool. Okay. Jeremy, I appreciate your time. If yes, people have sir. more, um, would like more information about you, they can go to JaniceResearch.co. Appreciate it, Jeremy. Thank you so much.
Hey, thanks for watching this episode of The 1004 Show. I want to tell you guys about something that we just released that we're super passionate about. It's called Inbox. It's a series of scenarios that business owners have inevitably had to go through. And what do they do when they go through these? Stuff like what happens when you get a bad review on social media? Or more deadly, what do you do when a customer tells you that they can't pay you for the work that you've done? Check it out in the show notes or at startwithhatch.com backslash inbox.